Great. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. And I designed this to be for um Chinese. So I want you to interrupt if you have questions during any part of my talk. I'd be happy to answer um questions. So towards quantitative microbiology, and it's uh, um I would say that's you know this is towards right. So towards so quantitative. What's quantitative biology? So in my view, I do not just mean like you quantify the number of cells in your in your culture. I do not just mean that you know the right statistical tests to use. What I actually mean is that, uh, um, oh, I don't know why this is not working. Why is it not working? It's just, mm -hmm. it's, okay, so it's a quantitative understanding of microbial, uh, mic microbial biology. Right? So let's look, take a look at this. Can you see the title? I, I don't know why this, okay, so good, this is gone. So biology is very far from quantitative understanding, right? So let's look at this, you know, nature news models overestimate Ebola cases. Rate of infection in Liberia seems to plateau, raising questions over the usefulness of models in outbreak. And uh, um, forecasting for COVID-19 has failed. Epidemic forecasting has a dubious track record and its failures became more prominent with COVID-19. Poor data input, wrong modeling assumptions, high sensitivity of estimates, lack of incorporation of epidemiological features, poor past evidence on effects of available interventions, lack of transparency, errors, lack of determinacy, cons consideration of only one or a few dimensions of the problem at hand, lack of expertise in crucial disciplines, group thinking and bandwagon effects, and the selective reporting are some of the causes of these failures. Nevertheless, epidemic forecasting is unlikely to be abandoned. So of course, COVID-19 is an extremely complex system. So then, when I was doing a postdoc, I just, I asked, well, could I do this for, for a simpler living systems? So I thought to engineer my own um, simplified ecological systems using the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So the budding yeast are the cells that you use to bake your bread and, uh, you know, brew your beers. It's extremely easy. Uh, it's extremely easy to do genetic manipulations in the yeast. So I could take strains, I can make them fluoresce different colors so I can track what's going on. So for one of the populations, I would, I, I, I would make them uh, not be able to make lysine, which is an essential amino acid for the cell. I would also int int uh, introduce a mutation so that, those, um, so that the cells would overproduce adenine. So normally speaking, cells are very clever, right? They just make enough metabolite for their use. So if there's too much metabolite, that would the metabolite, the end product would um, feedback inhibit the first enzyme. So then the cells will know I have too much and I will just stop making it. But those those mutants, they those mutations make cells not be able to be inhibited by the end product. So as a result, they just produce like a kind of non-stop. So they overproduce. So we call this L minus A plus. And the complementary strain cannot make adenine, but overproduce, uh, overproduce lysine. And we call this A minus L plus. So overproduced metabolites are released into the medium and allowing the two strains to um, feed each other. So we call this COSMO, right? For cooperation that is synthetic and mutually obligatory. And we can write down equations to describe the dynamics of the system, right? So first of all, we have the population size of L minus A plus, it changes due to birth minus death. And the birth, the birth rate would be a function of lysine because they need the lysine to grow. Similarly, the um, dynamics of A minus L plus is a function of birth minus death where the birth rate is a function of adenine because they these need adenine. And then the lysine concentration is a function of release which is each of the live cells A minus L plus can release say at a constant you know, amount per hour so RL and the consumption. So consumption is due to birth of new cells. So each of the birth of the new cells would consume a fixed amount of lysine. So C means consumption, R means release. And then we can write a similar equation for A. So it's a very, like in a well-mixed environment, this is a very, it's just a very simple uh, system of ordinary differential equations. So is that clear so far? Is everybody with me so far? No questions. Okay, so I will go on. So in fact, you can simulate this. Um, so, so you, but the, the problem, can you see the, my entire screen? Can you see the title? 
like I have all these things blocking the the view, but I want to see for the for the. Can you see the? Yes, can we can see, see the. I can see. Yes. Oh, you can see the entire. Oh, that's good. So I think it's just unique to my thing. The, the sin of free parameters. It says. Yes, yes, I see on free parameters. So free parameters are unmeasured parameters that can be chosen to fit data, right? And so um, a mathematician von Neumann says, with four parameters, I can fit the elephant. And then with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. So I thought, well, what about if I just measured every single parameter, then I will not be accused of committing this crime, right? So so that was the the, the plan. And the, the free parameter can be a big problem. So uh, Tao et al. has written a bio essay article on this, a uh, very interesting article. So here they use a, a general logical Volterra model. And so this is the ground truth interaction network. And uh, there are, this is dynamics. And so this is punctuated by some perturbations. So you, you see the dynamics, right? So then you could, uh, you, you, you could fit your, and they start with logical Volterra, they fit logical Volterra into this and to see what parameters, what do they, what do they get and what do they recover this? So you can see the, the simulated, using simulated, using the inferred parameters, the dynamics look almost identical, right? So it's a very, very good fit to reality. But if you look at the interaction networks, you see that they look very different. So for example, three and eight are connected here, but not there. Right? So that is the, uh, that is, it illustrates a problem of, uh, of not you know, measuring parameters and just use three parameters, it can get you the, um, the, the raw model and thus stop being predictive, even though these three parameters can fit the data very well. So I thought, okay, I will measure my own parameters, right? So, I, so this is a, the experimental results. So if we grow the mix of two strains together in the absence of lysine and adenine, so they're forced to you know, cross feed each other. So we are looking at total population size against time in a semi-log plot. And we observe that after initial lag, the community grows um, in exponential fashion, right? The straight line, it's, it's, that means it's exponential. And you will have, uh, and you can see also the ratio has reached a, a fixed value because the green grows at the same rate as the red and the same as the black, which is total. So the entire population are growing at exactly the same rate. And so, of course, the features you can try to understand. For example, we might want to understand the lag phase, right? The duration of the lag phase. But I chose an easier problem. I, I, I just, you know, I, 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 we, we, we said, well, just why don't we just try to figure out whether we can predict the steady state? We call the steady state community growth rate because the growth rate is not changing. I mean, it's just growing at a constant rate. So the slope of that is a steady state community growth rate. And we call this um, GSS, the growth rate at a steady state. And so the, the goal is, again, the problem statement is the following. If I were to measure the parameters, right, the parameters, the, the release consumption, so on and so forth, in monocultures, would I be able to predict the steady state community growth rate? So that's a problem statement. So then the question is that which parameters should we measure, right? So I'm just copying here again, the set of equations that I just showed you like a couple of slides ago. And so if we're looking at the steady state growth rate, how would you go about simplify this system? So I'm just asking the, the, the students in the audience, how would you, how would you go about you know, simplify the problem? Any takers? I'll give you a minute. So again, they're growing at a constant rate, right? A fixed rate, both populations. No one? I don't believe that. Anyone? Anyone want to take a guess? <clears throat> Maybe you'll repeat the question again. So. Yes. Okay, so how would you, so given that they are growing at a fixed rate, right? So the both populations are growing at a fixed rate. And we want to actually understand the, the steady state growth rate. And then I have a system of four equations, right? And how would you simplify that, you know, the four equations? So I'll give you a hint. So in fact, this can be dramatically simplified, right? To actually get you a formula for 
steady state growth rate. So remember at a steady state growth rate, they are growing at the same rate, right? That the both species are growing at exactly the same rate. Uh, maybe like uh, if we try to incorporate initial conditions uh, in the uh, rate is same and maybe we, we can extract uh, some. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Can you please repeat? Uh, so since the population is uh, growing at the same rate, so maybe we can look at the initial conditions and uh, uh, get some uh, coefficients uh, so that we can back substitute and uh, simplify the equations. That is my like uh, vague guess. I'm not sure. I see. I see that. That's good. Thank you for trying. I really appreciate that. So, um, so the, the, you know, so the way to look at it is actually, you know, because this is fixed, right? So basically, so if they're growing at a fixed rate, so that tells you the lysine concentration, like if this one is just growing at a fixed rate, so the lysine concentration must be fixed. If the lysine concentration is varying, the growth rate cannot possibly be fixed, right? So that means this, this, the lysine concentration is not changing with time. So that means you can set this equation to zero. And similarly, because this population is growing at a fixed rate, so then the adenine concentration must also be fixed, right? And as a result, you can set the second equation also, you can set both equations to zero. Does that make sense? Because if the nutrient concentrations were varying, the growth rates would be varying. Right, so the fact that they are not very means you can set them to zero. And then once we have this realization, it's very simple now. So we set to zero, we just move them around and then we multiply both sides, right? And then we can cancel these out, right? And so here um, we can uh, cancel these out. And then, then, so I would say like the depth is actually very low in the system, so we can ignore them. So actually both are similar to GSS, right? The, the community growth rate is the same as these. So then you would have, you would have this simply becomes the product of the two release rate divided by the product of the two consumption amount and then do square root. So this is, I feel like, is a one of the really powerful <laughs> usage of the model, right? Because the model can teach us which parameters to measure. For example, how exactly the birth rate varies with lysine concentration in the monode, like the monode constant and maximum growth rate. It's just not relevant. You don't need that. And can somebody give me intuition of why, like now knowing how this goes around, right? Like you only need to release rate and consumption. It's actually the other, the more detailed, like this birth rate as a function of lysine or adenine is not required. Can somebody give me some intuition of why that's the case? That might be the case. Is it because those processes are just in flux between the two subpopulations and uh, will not affect the dynamics of the total system? I see, sorry, I cannot hear. Like, I cannot hear very well. Can you repeat? Yeah, uh, is it because uh, those uh, lysis and uh, the other process, uh, and I missed, those are kind of like just in flux uh, within the system and uh, will not affect the dynamics of the total? Yeah, I, I think I think I, I I think I get what you were saying, right? So were you saying that? So the the, the reason, right? Like the, the the reason, like the way I think about it is the following, right? Because this talks about how fast you're eating the meals, right? The cells are eating the meals provided by their partner, but that's actually not really limiting, right? The really limiting step is the supply of metabolites from the partner. So it doesn't matter how fast you eat if your partner is supplying your meals very infrequently. It really doesn't matter, right? So like how fast you eat the meal is irrelevant when the limiting step is how fat, how often your partner gives you that meal, right? So I hope that's clear. So, so that's right. my intuition for, for this. For, for, for this, uh, this is. So that, the problem becomes really easy now, right? You only, we only need to measure two parameters for two strengths, the release rate and consumption. So now I will show you how we attempted to do that. So this work, the experimental work was mainly done by Sam Hart, a very talented, um, lab member, uh, experimentalist. So to measure consumption, right? So for example, if we want to measure how much adenine is consumed for each birth of the adenine requiring cells, we just have some batch cultures, right? And we just add different concentrations of adenine in those batch cultures. So we put in some cells that require adenine and we wait 
until they reach final turbidity. So the turbidity is proportional to soil density and we have a formula to convert it to. And we get a very straight line, right? So that so then the one over slope is a consumption in the unit, for example, femtomol per cell. Right, so you have micromolar divided by like cells per, uh, you know, uh, divided by the cells per milliliter. So you have femtomol per cell and there's a volume, a volume cancel. So you have this, so that's, uh, that's how we measure um, consumption. But the same assay can also be used to measure concentrations of adenine in any unknown sample, right? For example, if you want to measure release, you will need to know how much is in the medium. So the way you do it is you take some, you know, you, you take some unknown sample, like it's supernatant of some culture where, you know, adenine has been released to, and you add these cells and you ask what's the final turbidity. And then you can back calculate the, the adenine concentration in the supernatant. So then now, so uh, this consumption is very easy. Now, what about release, right? So release, we kind of want to know the cell, like the cell density, how much, you know, uh, you know this is the same as HPLC. So like we want to distinguish alive versus dead populations, right? Because we want to know whether the release is caused by dead versus live cells, which can interpret, you know, like it can alter the interpretation of the experiments. So to do that, we mix a cell sample with no amount of fluorescent beads, right? So we know exactly like the how many, like maybe a million beads per, Per like a per milliliter, or so on and so forth. Just a small sample of that, and then by looking at the cell to bead ratio, we would be able to know the cell density. We also add a DNA staining dye. So those dyes would stain. Um, would so if the cells are like have compromised the membrane, then those dyes would be able to get into the cells, get into the nucleus, and stain the DNA. And that the cells would fluoresce differently from live cells. So that's example, right? So the these so the beads that the super fluorescent, so you can be easily gated away from the rest. And this is forward side scattering, and you can gate cells away from these tiny little dusts. And from those cells, you can then gate again against the dye, right? The death dye. If it's a high death dye, means dead. Otherwise, it's alive. So that's how we measure population dynamics. And then if the, the, it's a mixture of the two strains, then we can look at you know one's red, one green that can be further gated. Right, for um, out of live cells, you can get for the two populations. Sorry, um, so oh, when you, you go back, so I want uh, what does this uh, uh, what do the fluorescent beads do here? Oh, the beads will tell us the density. So, the, the, the so the, the fluorescent beads will tell us, like, for example, if I added a certain amount of beads to there, I know exactly how many beads I added, right? And then if I look at cell to bead ratio, I would, I would know the absolute abundance. Of the cells in my culture. Oh, okay, I see. Sorry, yeah. So those, so, so so those bead samples we actually count them under you know using different ways of counting like culture counter on yeah. a micro microscope using you know hemocytometer independent ways of counting so that we we want absolute abundance right so we don't just want ratios so that fluorescent beads give us the absolute abundance. Okay, so so the release right so the way we do it so ideally I know that we should measure release in you know in in this in, in uh, when cells are growing certain ways, right? So, but when we grow cells in exponential phase in a lot of metabolites, we don't see any release of this, right? So we thought, well, for this Cosmo community, they grow really slowly. So it's approximately like the cells are approximately starving. So the way we did it is we take those cells, we add lysine to them and, uh, you know, so to grow them up because we have to have enough cells to have each, even measure release, right? So grow them up and then we wash the lysine away so they are starved. And then we start the clock and it starts the, the timer, right, to measure how much it released over, over time. So this is the live cell density. So you see that cells are dying and the dead cells are accumulating. And you look at then one also measures extracellular adenine concentration by, by using the bioassay I just showed you a couple of slides ago. And so the dead cells are going up and extracellular concentration is going up. But I know it's not dead release because we can crash the, we can crack up those cells, the live cells, so no amounts of live cells and see how much is in the live cells. And those release is just no way you can explain. This is such high, you know, like the, the dead, each dead cell would have to release so much metabolite to account for that. So we know that's not important. So now let's focus on the live cells, right? So this amount of release of adenine is due to that many cells releasing over this period of time, right? So it's due to the area, right? It's the area on the curve, so we, I call it beta. So you can plot this alpha, right? You can plot this alpha 
okay. against the beta, right? So for this beta amount of, you know, so like a, a, almost like a man hour, right? But then here's cell hour. All these cells are working for so many hours, right? And then they give you this alpha. You can then iteratively do for the later time points. And you get actually a quite straight line. And the slope is really straight, right? In terms of femtomo per cell per hour. Right, so you can see it's this, it, this gives you this, you know, per volume, like femtomo per volume, this gives you cells per volume per hour. So the volume of volume cancel out, it becomes femtomo per cell per hour. So the units are correct. All right, so we can do this for both strains and what do we get? So this is the real experimental data and this is the predicted data, right? How predicted, so given the measurements we did in batch cultures. So the prediction is a lot faster than the observed observed the community growth rate. So that was very discouraging to me, right? So I, I thought I engineered the simplest possible um, system, cross-feeding system. And I, you know, the minute I start quantifying those parameters, it just won't work. Of course, free parameter, if you, if you just allow me to even have one free parameter, I can make this arbitrarily accurate, right? But that's meaningless, right? So, so that means like, just even, even such a simple system, I, I will not be able to predict, uh, to understand why they're growing at this rate. So it was very discouraging, but you know, but the good thing is that the same system, I also use it to study the evolution of cooperation because each one had to pay a cost to help the partner. So you can ask, well, how the cooperative community could, you know, sustain cheaters and so on and so forth. So fortunately that front worked well. So I was still able to get the faculty position, right? And so the, the whole thing it made me think that maybe I just quantitative modeling is just not possible for life systems. And because there are many reasons, right? There are many reasons why it will not work. So we put it aside for a while, right? So we, we just said, okay, we will do qualitative modeling, trying to get qualitative insights from the model and not worry about quantitative matching because it's just too hard. And so that time Sam joined the lab and we were asking some very simple question, right? Like, so for example, can cells evolve to become more cooperative, right? To be more cooperative because the, the, the dogma says they will become more you know, cheating. They will never become more cooperative. We just were curious. We just look at, we just basically, we are going to look at take evolved clones and compare with ancestor. So the, the, the cooperativeness is mathematically defined as a release rate per consumption. So for example, if you, you consume very little of the products from your partner and you give that partner a lot, then you're of course very cooperative. So this is a metric, right? So release rate divided by consumption. So this is what happened, right? So, so Sam, you know, he would, as a good experimentist, he was at a triplicate. He will set up a triplicate experiment each time. Right, so triplicate ancestor versus a triplicate evolved. So uh, for like this, like uh, for the for my first trial, they evolved like the, all three will look very similar, and all three ancestors will look very similar and evolved above ancestor. So that's good. So it means well, we 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 find some something really neat. But then after a couple of weeks, he would repeat the experiment, right? And then this time it will be indistinguishable. The core, the three cooperative uh, cooperative like, the evolved strains and three ancestral strains they look indistinguishable. We tried really hard to control everything, the cell density, the environment, every, anything you can think of, we try to control. But it's just, it's extremely variable, right? So we get like ancestor, huge error bar, mutant, huge error bar, and no conclusion can be drawn from this kind of, this kind of data. So, so we were at the impasse for like, I want to say at least a year, right? So we were just chasing our tails, trying to figure out why, you know, why it's so variable. So eventually it dawned on me, right? Like maybe those assays were just no good, right? So if those assays, the release rate and consumption could not help me to predict uh, community growth rate, maybe there's something wrong with the assay. And I actually know the culprit, right? I, I can kind of guess because I knew I made assumption. I, I made assumption that right, starvation approximates, you know, slowly growing cultures. And maybe that is not, it's not a good approximation. Uh, but so, so then we thought, oh, to, to, to do the experiments properly, we would need the chemostats, right? So chemostats, what are chemostats? This is invented by a physicist called Leo Zillar. And so aeronautic biologist was using that to do experiments. So I would say that for the entire talk, if you just understand chemostat, you got your hour worth the money already, right? So if you just understand that this part of the talk. Um, so how it works is the following, right? So the chemostats, you have a stir bar, make sure everything's stirred. You have this culture volume and then this drip in. So there's this pump in by pump. And this is a fresh minimal medium. And the, so the lysine concentration is L in. I call it L in, so it's, it's fixed, right? Because experimentalists mix up the medium and then they know the fixed concentration of some lysine, fresh medium. And it gets dripped in. 
and then the overflow cells and medium gets you know discarded. Right, so this is how the system works. And again, to see how it works, we should write down, uh, we, we, you know, so this is dilution rate, right? So it's like the flow rate divided by the volume. And this is our homemade uh, chemostats, right? So it's eight channel chemostats. So the equation is uh, following, right? So life cell density is increases due to birth, decreases due to death and dilution. The death cell density increases due to the death, right? So it's just this term and it decreases due to outflow, the dilution. The lysine concentration in this reservoir is increased due to inflow because it's dripped in. So L in, dripped in at the dilution rate and the minus the outflow by the, the, and the consumption. Right? Consumption is dictated by C and then the, the birth. And adenine, the release adenine concentration is increased due to release at some fixed rate and decrease due to some out, the outflow, the, the dilution effect. And we know that they can achieve steady state. And so we can set all these to zero, right? So we can look at the, what happens in the steady state. And we, uh, at steady state, the depth you can see, it's like a small fraction of light, right? Because this log, so it's like a small fraction. So we can kind of ignore it. So the birth rate is basically like a dilution rate. So you can play God here, right? So you can control how fast cells grow by controlling the pump rate or pumping in the, the medium, right? So this birth rate equals the pumps in dilution. And so now here, the death rate is simply you just put them equal and they're divided by this, right? So the so basically it's the, you can, you know the dilution rate because you set the pump. You know the dead cell density because you did it from facts and you, did, you know, also know the life cell density. So you can also get the death rate. It's indeed very low. And then we let's get to this equation, right? So So this one, so remember the death rate is approximately birth rate, right? So the dilution, dilution birth rate can just be divided out. And this, this concentration of lysine in the culture, this, the, the, the culture vessel is very low, it's nearly zero, so it can be ignored. So now we're getting this. So then we get consumption is uh, the L in, which is, you know, because you made the medium divided by the NL, right, the cell density. So in fact, this is a step that you can play God a second time, right? You can control the NL, you can control the life cell density Right by controlling the the input lysine concentration, so chemostat allows you to play God twice. So once is controlling the, the birth rate, the second is controlling the, the steady state cell density. So going to the final release rate, and it's just also very simple because you know the dilution rate. You, you can measure the release at any concentration, and divide by NL, which can be measured by facts. Right. So this is very straight. You one experiment gets you all parameters, and you can vary the the, the growth rate. So let's look at the experimental results, right? So they indeed get into steady state, the live dead cell densities. But so this is for L minus A plus cells. But something like strange actually kind of happens. So like for the lysine, it's supposed to be steady state, but we don't see, we don't see steady state, right? So it basically goes up and it then start to come down. Um, why do you think that might be the case? So I want to open this up to students, to trainees in the audience. Like this is ex exactly as expected, but why would this be not be able to be maintained at a steady state? I kind of already give you the answer up there. So <laughs> rapid evolution, right? So what happens is the following. And um, so, so we can have place with low lysine, we can take samples, like put ancestor, we can spread ancestor cells or chemo set for 40 hours there, and then we just wait, right? So for ancestor, you can see, right? Like it's very tiny, but you can see the dots. The, each dot is a single cell, like this is budding cell. But if you look at evolved, right? They actually form these mini colonies. So they can, you know, they're much better at using limited lysine than ancestor, right? In fact, um, we, so, so we can quantify that. So this is like 4% evolved. This is 40% evolved. It, by this time, it's like mainly, right? Like, uh, like the, 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 the a significant fraction of cells that are already evolved. We can be uh, more quantitative, right? We can quantify those cell growth rate. And so we have this uh, uh, automated microscope that can do, you know, like they, they, can, they can look at many wells at, so we can grow cells at different concentrations of lysine and like look at how their biomass changes over time. And so this is a figure like this, right? So the biomass, so the total fluorescence is a very good proxy for biomass. 
So this is lysine concentration at different concentrations. This is total uh, fluorescence over time. And then we can, we, let's focus on zero lysine, right? So we see the initial growth and that's called, that's due to residual growth. So those cells will grow up in the presence of lysine, right? And so they have storage. So when you wash away lysine time zero, they can use the storage to grow a bit. And then in the end, right, in the absence of lysine, they will start to die. But at the various concentrations, you will see different growth rates. And then we basically quantify growth rates before 25% of the input nutrients is used, right? So because it's a bit weird, because you are measuring the, the growth rate at some fixed lysine concentration while the cells are consuming those concentrations, those lysine. So it's not, strictly speaking, you know, it's maybe not you know, as accurate as one would like to be, but we have validated this assay with like independent assay in chemostat. So we know this is good as long as we, uh, we make sure that more, not more than 25% is used, we get, you know, we have very nice curves like this. So this is growth rate of ancestor and various evolved clones as at different concentrations of lysine. Right, so we see that ancestor grows like this, and the evolved ones grow much better than the ancestor on the low concentrations of lysine, although many of them suffer fitness cost at high concentrations of lysine. So this is what's relevant to the community, right? So in fact, from here, we can deduce that mutants can grow 3.6 fold faster than the ancestor. And using this, we can back calculate, right? The, the back calculate the abundance of these mutants at the beginning of the experiment. So it turns out that we, you know, it's about one out of million cells. Like even before we start the chemostat experiment, right? There would already be one out of ten to the uh, one out of million. And with this kind of like extremely rapid fitness, uh, extremely extremely large fitness advantage, they could get up to like the the four percent, forty percent that I showed you, right? In in the last slide. So the evolved clones are much better at using living lysine, right? And they are far far more fit than the ancestor. And so these experiments are really tricky. So the way we deal with it is just truncated. So we don't use data, right? Like when before so we have to finish the experiment before 24 hours. So to avoid you know, the mutants take over. And so that, that's how we dealt with one of the strains. And then the other strain is even more bizarre, right? So even when we start at start the experiment, the mutants already is at a few percent, right? So it's not, you have to wait until like 20 hours, 24 hours, it's already a few percent. So we quantified those mutants. So again, show this fitness trade-off, right? So at the low concentration, the, the green evolved clone is grows faster than the ancestor, although not as fast, you know, the fitness difference is not as dramatic as the other partner or the, the lysine minus cells, but at high concentration, it really suffers a very large fitness cost. So in fact, we adapted this for our like high throughput way of assaying like the fraction of mutants, right? So we just look at like a, give them a high, a high adenine concentration. The ancestor overnight can grow to saturation, but evolved cells are just really inhibited. And so if we look at the random clones from chemostats, we see that those two are evolved and the rest are fine. So that's how we can quickly assay, right? The, the fraction evolved in, in any kind of samples. So that turns out that, you know, like that these are independent chemostats runs as percent evolved as a function of time. So it's not like hugely changing, but at the beginning, it's already really abundant. And like for Cosmo, it's more or less similar. So we reason well because Cosmo looked very similar to the, 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 the chemostats, like the, 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 the properties that we measure in chemostats should be able to be used in Cosmo. And so, so to, in order to have this kind of like abundance, so we back calculate again. So that's like sort of like the power of back on the envelope calculation, right? So these mutants must be generated, given that the fitness advantage is not that dramatic, they must be generated at enormous rate, right? So it's like around 0.01 per cell per generation. So just as a comparison, right? So drug resistant mutation rate is about 10 to negative six to 10 to negative eight per cell per generation, right? And then the highest chromosome disaggregation rate is about 0.015 per cell per generation. So we suspect that this is due to like extremely high chromosome disaggregation rate, but maybe that's because this is adenine minus and the adenine is a base that's used to make you know, DNA. So possibly that is, well, but we do not know the reason. But regardless, you know, we are encouraged that, you know, there's no correlation between percent evolved versus measured phenotypes, right? The consumption and it releases the same. You don't see much. So like we just use the, just, we basically just, because the equivalently rapidly evolving. So, so we just use the chemostat phenotype as the, the one to, you know, for, for, the, for, for the prediction problem. So now like we, so this is the phenotype, right? The consumption. So this is batch saturated culture. This is chemostat run at a different growth rates, 
and then we see they are different. But even more dramatically, right, it's the release rate, right, of this uh, release rate of, of the lysine release rate of the adenine minor cells. So here, as as I said, like starve, that's what we measured initially, and those then fit the data didn't fit the growth rate well, and it's an exponentially growing cultures they don't release much, and the blue dotted line is our assay detection limit, and so again we run this in different chemo stats, and this is a causal relevant environment. And then we see that the release rate is actually highly non, not constant. It is very sensitive to doubling time. And then once we use this to, uh, to, to, to this, we can, you know, we can actually now calculate the growth, the community steady state growth rate using the chemostat uh, parameters. So we see this is much lower than the batch culture. But then we ask ourselves, how might we test these model predictions, right? Because given evolution is so fast, Maybe we would maybe we should test them in a spatially structured environment, right? So that brings back to the, the, the testing the most so that when evolved mutants show up, they are spatially constrained in where they they, they show up and then instead of rapidly spreading through the, the, the shaken tube. So this is sort of like the, the, uh, the experimental setup. And uh, um and then we also did the spatial simulations of this, and it's actually very similar to the, this just from simple square root release rate times release rate divided by consumption times consumption. Now the comparison was experiments, right? So now finally our, our, our uh, you know, our calculations like match, like match the experiments, I would say quantitatively, right? So this is those error bar is due to propagation of the uncertainty of measuring of the four parameters. And also, so this, you know, so after the full, um, a circle, go back to uh, go back to this problem, right? Like, uh, can cells evolve to become more corporate? So now with chemo stats, the, the error bar just shrink, right? So this ancestor they become extremely reproducible for mutants come uh, you know, extremely reproducible. So finally, we can say yes, we have a mutant that can evolve to become more corporate, right? So that so the so it's 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 a story that how like not respecting math could cost you a lot of time and how listening to math rescue the two papers, right? So basically we, this sort of like, it takes time, but it, it rescue the two papers, like uh, just in this kind of this realization. So again, the lessons, right? So I feel quantitative modeling is possible in a simplified system, but it's very challenging. So first of all, rapid evolution can occur during parameter quantification. And the second, you know, parameters can be environment sensitive so it may not be a constant. And the reason is like we black box all the cellular physiology, right? In this like release rate. And so it, like there's no reason why biology had to keep this constant for us. And then it's also very useful um, because this discrepancy suggests model, uh, suggests knowledge gap. In our case, the knowledge gap is, is that, you know, it's assay is not good enough to capture what's going on. And, but agreements increase confidence, right? So now we know how to do that. So our future direction is trying to understand whether we can understand community level property while community members undergo evolution. And so if we predict something is going to happen and then we measure the evolved community, it doesn't happen, then it could mean that the new interactions have evolved, right? And so that is my sort of like the tutorial. And thank you for your attention. I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Ying, for this uh, very uh, introductory, uh, you know, uh, a nice introduction to this quantitative uh, microbiology. Um, so, uh, first of all, already in the chat box, there's a question. I think uh, uh, for your early uh, at, in the slide at the beginning, your questions. Yeah. Do you want to address that? I Is see. Even, that. Eva, are you there? Yes. Uh, Eva, okay. Could you let? Hi. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. Um, hi, Professor Sho. Uh, th this was um, this was in regards to your question on um, how to simplify the differential equations. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yes, yes, they are equal to each other because the growth rate are because death rate is nearly non there, right? So I can go back. Yes, they are equal to each other. Thank you. Okay, so when you, in your study, all this really, uh, talk, you talk about the bulk average, right? You uh, There's another layer of complexity, is the cell, cell heterogeneity, that each cell may even have different uh, release rate or uh, consumption rate. And there's a cycle, 
right? Yeah. Yeah, so I feel like the, the, the release rate, the beat heterogeneous, I'm not as worried because you can average out. The, what is the most worrisome is like the growth rate being heterogeneous, right? Because in that way, you can, the, the takeover is exponential, the, 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 the kinetics is exponential. So, but the, the thing is that, so the thing that I, I don't believe it's is um, super, um, because I can't achieve quantitative agreement in the end, Mm -hmm. So I feel like I, I'm allowed to neglect cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity if there's any, right? If there's any, that means it's not important. So that's another advantage of quantitative matching, right? So then the audience will ask you all sorts of things. You say, well, that cannot be that important because I already achieved the quantitative agreement, right? Without any free parameters. Uh, Arnold? Hello. Yes, I also have a question. Uh, First of all, like really nice talk, and I think I learned a lot actually. My my question is about uh, the uh, mixing in the chemo stats. So you said there is a stir bar which is rotating all the time and making sure that the concentration of the chemicals, but also the cells, is is uniform in space. And I was wondering, have people ever studied turning off this mixing and um, allowing the cells to maybe form biofilms or structures? Um, and maybe you could still keep the chemical concentrations uniform in space, but the bacteria themselves could perhaps form communities with spatial structure. Do you know if anyone has ever studied that? No, I, I want to say that's a problem that like all experimentalists hate. Like the, the problem you're saying, yeah. the problem you're saying is actually a problem. Because what happens is that you're selecting for like biofilms that cling to the, the, the vessel wall. Yes. So you immediately lose your ancestral population and you just keep those. So like, so they come up with a very sophisticated ways of like changing the vessel out to select against those adherent ones. And for us, it's because it's finished within 24 hours and also yeast, uh, not like bacteria, bacteria really like to, they are very sticky, but the yeast are not very sticky. So we're very lucky in that regard, right? And, yeah. and the, so the people have studied, right? So people have, have, have constructed those flow systems to study, say, dental microbiome, like so dental biofilm, right? So they have these plastic, like they, you know, like or even enamels, right? They, they have the enamels and then they grow, they grow these, you know, microbiome and then flow with saliva and see what the dynamics are like. So the biofilm, like in that context, is important, right? Because for for dental microbiome, like it's important they stick to the to the surface, right? So then that's how they know the colonization patterns of the the teeth and so on and so forth. Yeah, I imagine that you then indirectly put some selective pressure in terms yes. of adhesion. Yes. I see. Yes. yes. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. So, Wei I noticed you talk about this uh, complexity of parameters, environmental sensitive. This is a, a real problem. So, um, that reminded me uh, because you talk about this um, uh, quantum misaggregation. I remember uh, Rong Li has some work to show, you know, under stress. Uh, those yeast will increase their chromosome misdirection rate. I think try to have faster search of the the uh, the that's, genome. That's rate, right. right. That's right. So yes, I think that could also be. That's right. The mutation rate. The, 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 the that could absolutely. So the very high, extremely high um, mutation rate for the A minus L plus could also be due to could also like uh, could contribute to the extremely high mutation rate of A minus L plus. So I think for your control system, you can really uh, set to different environments and look for those parameters, right? Yeah. So for the, those so parameters, like if I set to different environment, right? Like I could see different, like a uh, uh, like release rate, right? So I know release rate, and it's actually really um, amazing. So what we found is that because so what happens is that right? So, so that's a, maybe a little bit more convoluted story, right? So the what happens is that cells. If you look at how yeast works, so what yeast, yeast has been evolved for like you know for a very long period of time, and they they know right, so they know what they need, right? They know they need you know they need the carbon, they need the nitrogen, they need the phosphate, sulfur, all this. So they have this very very intricate system to detect this natural nutrients. So these oxytrophs, in fact, what happened is these oxytrophs sort of like lysine minus cells. They look around, what well, is enough glucose? Everything. So I should try to divide. They did not know, like they did not know, right? And, and, and you know, like a sort of like a metaphorically speaking, that they cannot make lysine. So this discoupling, so this causes a discoupling between like nutrient availability and the you know the cell state. So cell actually should not have been growing, but they try to grow. 
and they try to grow. And then, so as a kind of like a, a consequence of this, they actually start to release like a um, glutathione. They actually, those cells start to release glutathione, which is sort of like a redox buffer. And then, so then you actually, it's really interesting how new evolution, like new types of interactions can evolve in this kind of systems. So then those other cells, so a fraction of the cells would evolve to be like minus, like a meth minus. So it will stop making their own methionine. Sort of like, and then to use the glutathione, really, glutathione is an organo sulfur, right? So it has sulfur come out. So they use glutathione released by other cells as a sulfur source. And also these cells have advantage because now by not being able to make their methionine, they become limited. Finally, they start to see, oh, there's very limited like sulfur. So they should stop, they should like slow down growth. And that actually helped them to gain advantage over those other cells that, you know, that don't know how to coordinate nutrient availability with growth. So that's another example like that showed us that in that systems like this that can uh, show us at the cases where, where like the normal like regulation when it's dysregulated, what could happen, right? What could happen? And it's a very interesting. Other people saw that in stationary phase cells, uh, cells would also start to release compounds that they would normally otherwise not release. So that tells me also like the to quantify even the interaction network would depend. It's not just quantitatively, right? Qualitatively would depend on the environment. Right, so. Okay, I see. So any other questions, just uh, feel free to, uh, to turn on your microphone and ask. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, so I want to uh, ask a question about uh, a general philosophy you mentioned. So you said that uh, the by quantitative modeling uh, can help you determine which parameters you want to measure from yeah. the experiment. Um, but like for modeling, we generally want a parsimonious model, right? Like the gra gravitation law. So we want a very uh, simple model with few parameters, but that like fails dramatically when like a mountain data accumulates. So how do you think about that? And uh, how uh, do you see the future directions can deal with that? Yeah, I know, but so so I think our case is a bit different because we already because we engineer the system, right? So we know the the model, the 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 correct model. And you're right, like if you have if you don't know what's going on, then you would you don't even know like the model selection, you don't even know which model to use. In that case, maybe it is less, but at least for us, but at least for us, you know, that turned out to be very useful, right? So the reduce the amount of experiment by you know by quite a bit. Because it's actually not trivial to measure, like as I showed you, it's not trivial to measure the how the growth rate is a function of like like lysine or adenine concentrations, right? So uh, I, I just can only speak from my experience. Like for in this case, that was useful, and also like for chemostats, that's another example, right? Like so so like how you could measure this just by doing the modeling, uh, just by writing down some equations, you immediately know how to measure all these parameters, right? From very simple, from very simple equations. But for models where you don't know the structure. I would say then it won't, then I would say, because if you don't even know the models, then you won't know the parameters. In some sense, you won't even know what parameters to measure, right? Because if you don't know, it's, it's being certain things being released. You won't even think about the measuring that the release rate of that compound, right? So I think it's a very well suited for engineered communities, especially where, you know, you know, the interactions are defined or simplified maybe in natural communities where the interactions are dominated by like one or two types of you know, mediators. I, so I think this is uh, for this type of communities. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Um, if no more questions, um, let's just thank Wen Ying again for this uh, very uh, nice introduction. Okay. I'll just thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.